And Michelle has offered to recite the text again, so I'm going to invite her to come on up and let us uh, center our hearts on God's Word and um, be ready to receive the truth that he offers us today. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is the word. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Yeah, you know, I'm kind of a, a people watcher. I don't know if you're like me, but I, when I go places, I, sometimes I just enjoy watching people and seeing what they're doing. And, you know, I go to the airport, for example, and I see all the people running around and scurrying to get to their gates and see people from different cultures and different, different countries speaking different languages. And I wonder what journey they're on or where they're going or what they're up to. Um, I go to the park and I see little kids run around and playing and they're doing their make, make-believe games or just playing tag or climbing on the jungle gym or whatever they're doing and just enjoy watching them uh, enjoy life and having fun and, and laughing and playing together. I, I, I go to the mall and I see um, people at the food court and they're just kind of rummaging around and enjoying their food and laughing and talking and, and visiting with each other. And I get a lot of pleasure just of kind of observing people in their life, you know, watching human behavior uh, seeing them have fun and, and talking and, and laughing and playing. But every once in a while when I'm observing other people like that, and whether it's at a park or the, the mall or uh, an airport, whatever the case may be, every once in a while I, I look at people and I, and I come to the sobering realization that many of the people I'm watching are dead. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul tells us in this text. And it's, it sounds kind con- Contradictory, you know, it might sound um, even nonsensical. We look around and we see people, people that are healthy and happy and they're running around and laughing and playing and working and going to school, but there's a very real sense in which they're dead. And many of the, the people I, I see at the park or at the airport, they're dead for the same reason as the Apostle Paul says that the members of the church in Ephesus were once dead. They're dead because they're living in a state of sin. Paul says, you were dead in the transgressions and sins in which you once lived. And so somehow, in a way that's hard for us to get our our minds around, there's people all around us who are physically alive, and yet they're spiritually dead. And it's hard to grasp what that might mean. I've been kind of thinking through this text and praying through it, and I'm convinced that it means at least three things. For a person to be physically alive, and spiritually dead. First of all, it means that they are unresponsive to the will of God. The second thing I think it means is they're insensitive to a relationship with God. And then thirdly, they're unreceptive to spending eternity with God. And so they're unresponsive to the will of God, insensitive to a relationship with God, and unreceptive to spending eternity with God. Now the first thing it means to be spiritually dead then is to be unresponsive to the will of God. I was just thinking back to when I was a little kid. Um, my dad took me fishing one time, and we went to the dam. And so as I remember, I was probably seven or eight. I wasn't very old. But as I remember it, we were on top of the dam. And, you know, it obviously makes a big wall walling off the river. And we'd cast our line down in the water. We we're trying to catch these fish, right? And I looked down over the edge of the dam and, and down almost up against the, the wall of the dam and right along the bank, the shallow area of the river, there's this huge catfish. I mean, the thing's enormous. I'm like, I got to catch that one, right? So I kept dropping my line down in front of that fish. I tried three or four times, and it would not go after my bait. I was like trying to drop the hook right straight in its mouth because I'm going to catch this thing. I want this monster, right? And after a few, a few different tries, a few more tries, 
I kind of expressed my frustration to my dad, and he realized what I was trying to do, and he said, you know, son, I don't think you're going to catch that one, because it's already dead. You know? <laughs> Not going to have a lot of luck catching that one. And this might come as a shock to you, but a fish must actually be alive to go after the bait, right? And we look at someone who's physically alive, and we see they respond to the world around them. They might be a very active person. They might, they might be ha- a happy person. They might do all kinds of good things. They might live in a manner that is, in many ways, commendable. But if that person is spiritually dead, they're unresponsive to the will of God, much as that fish was unresponsive to my bait. The fish I was trying to catch had, had drifted with the current and settled up against the, the wall of the dam and was in the shallow area along the bank of the river, and that fish was not going to go anywhere. It was certainly not going to move upstream. When a person is spiritually dead, they can't actively pursue the will of God. It's not their purpose. It's not their intent to glorify God in their life. A fish has to be alive to move upstream. A fish has to be alive uh, to go against the current. And a person who's spiritually dead, they might do all kinds of good things, but they'll never do anything that runs contrary to their own personal or selfish inclinations. They won't do anything that runs contrary to the, um, to the, the, the flow and the momentum of the culture that they live in. They can't swim against that current to actively pursue the will of God because they're spiritually dead. They might be a really good person in, in the eyes of the world. They, they might be a good person in our eyes, but they're not pursuing God's will. And so the things they're doing does not bring God glory. And bringing God glory is the purpose for which God has made us. And that leads us to the second point about a person who's spiritually dead. It's it's really related to the first one, but a person who's spiritually dead then is insensitive to a relationship with God. They're unresponsive to God's will because they're insensitive to God's love. When we come here to worship, we are celebrating the love that God has for us. We're celebrating that God has made himself in relationship with us, that we know him as our Father in heaven, and we are his sons and daughters. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we, ex- we, we celebrate his love for us, and we respond by expressing our love to him. We, we, we praise him through song and through the uh, expression of God's word and through our, 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 the prayers that we offer and even our, our fellowship with one another. We, we, we long to deepen that relationship, to, to experience his love for us and, and, and our love uh, for him. But people who are spiritually dead don't realize that God loves them. They don't want to experience God's love. And, and they're not inclined then to um, express love for God in, in return. Now, this is not a, a perfect an analogy. You know, when we're dealing with spiritual things using um, physical illustrations, it's never going to be 100% accurate. Because there are people who have some inclination towards God's love, some sensitivity towards God's love, some some curiosity about God or some desire to express love for God in some capacity, but they don't, they don't have a saving relationship with God. And um, I, would, I guess I would equate a person like that to maybe someone who's in a coma. And so a person who's in a coma, maybe they're kind of coming out of that coma, and there's a loved one uh, sitting on the edge of their bed, and, and, and they, they speak to that person, and they might respond with a, a flicker of the eye or maybe trying to mouth some words or, the loved one touches them on the arm, and they might respond by moving their fingers a bit. But, but they're certainly not alive in the fullness sense. They're not up out of the bed, active, doing things, and, and living as a person would, would, would hope to live. And the person who's in a coma then may be made fully alert. They may be fully aroused out of that coma and come to have a, a healthy and vibrant life. Or that person who's in a coma may regress back into a deeper state of coma and, and possibly succumb uh, to death. That, that hasn't yet been determined. But a person who is spiritually dead is, is insensitive to a relationship with God. And they need God to bring them to, to life as God intends it. Now finally, a person who's spiritually dead is unreceptive to spending eternity with God. And they're, they're physically alive now, but when their physical life on earth ends, in this grace period that God gives us to decide whether or not we're going to put our faith in Jesus, um, it's expired. And so then they have to stand before God's judgment seat. 
And because they were unreceptive to spending eternity with God, God will give them what they want. They'll be separated from God forever. I, I read, I watched a movie a long years ago, a long time ago, um, that was called uh, Dead Man Walking. And anyone remember that movie? Uh, Sean Penn and Susan Sarandon were in it. Sean Penn played this guy who did this horrible thing. Did you see it, Kevin? What's that? I can't hear what you're saying. So, so um, when Sean Penn had done these horrible things and was on death row, and people were on death row, they called them dead men walking. And Susan Sarandon plays a nun, and she's trying to offer some spiritual counsel, some co- comfort and encouragement in this, this time. But Sean Penn's character is physically alive, but he has no real life to speak of. He's stuck in this cell. He has no hope and no future because his, his death is imminent. And, and those who are unresponsive or unreceptive to spending eternity with God are in much the same situation. They're physically alive today, but their death is imminent. And they don't have any real hope at the moment for um, anything, anything greater or more wonderful. Um, the person on death row... Uh, will not escape their fate unless they're given a reprieve from the governor or from a president. And the person who's spiritually dead can't have the gift of eternal life unless somehow they receive a reprieve from the Savior. Now, if a person merely stopped living spiritually when their life was over and, and they just go into the ground and, and that's all there is to it, then not spending eternity with God might not sound like such a horrible thing, right? I mean, if you're just turn into dust, right? If you're just worm food when you die, you don't have any consciousness or any awareness of anything, you're just, you're just done, it's just over, then it wouldn't be that big of a deal. I mean, who cares? You, you don't, you're not aware of anything after you die, right? And that's what a lot of people think happens. We're just physical bodies, we die, we go to dust in the earth, and that's it. So what difference does it make, you know, what I believe during this lifetime? But verse 3 is very clear that that's not the case. The ultimate consequence of remaining in a state of spiritual death is actually very frightening. Paul says, we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. And, you know, no one wants to hear about God's wrath. And I don't like preaching about God's wrath. I'm not one of those hellfire and brimstone preachers. I I don't go out of my way to preach about, about hell. But if it's in the text, I need to be faithful to the text also. And we would be wise to pay close attention to God's word when it warns us about his judgment. So some people have trouble reconciling the idea that um, a loving God could be wrathful. And this, this idea might seem strange to you, but I, I believe it's the very fact that God is love that makes it necessary that those who reject him will be under his wrath, that they'll end up being in hell. And th- think about this. God is not merely loving He's not merely a source of love or the primary source of love in this world. God is love. All love ultimately comes from God, whether we experience it through other people or just kind of internally or however we might experience love in in our existence. All love ultimately comes from God because God is love. The inevitable consequence of that then is if we are separated from God, completely and finally separated from God, then we are separated from the source of all love. And there's nothing left remaining but anguish, loneliness, despair, grief, hatred, animosity. In the same way, God is good. Everything that's good ultimately comes from God. To be separated from God is to be separated from everything that is good, every trace of goodness. And the only thing that remains is is evil and, and sin and, and that which is wicked. And so the person who, who rejects or dismisses the grace of God is, in a passive sense, is under God's wrath because they've, they've separated themselves from all that is good. And there's nothing left but suffering. And, and those who also share in that state, and then that person is made victim to or in conflict with everyone else that has rejected God's love, whether it's the demons in hell or or other people. 
And so that state is, is hell. That state is hell. And so there's a sense in which God passively allows people to suffer from his wrath, but there's also a sense in which God actively exercises his wrath upon those who are guilty of sin. And that's even harder for us to accept. In fact, many people are so averse to hearing about God's wrath that they refuse to even consider the idea. And if you feel that way, that oh, God, you know, God wouldn't actively pour his wrath out on people. God is love, so he wouldn't do something like that. I want to challenge you with a thought. So um, in the news recently, there's this guy that went to prison. You probably heard of him named Jeffrey Epstein. You, you follow, follow that story? And I didn't follow the details of it. I don't know, you know the ins and outs of, of, of everything. But my understanding is he did some really horrible things, right? That he, he trafficked and abused girls and, and hurt a lot of people really badly. And so it, assuming everything he's accused of doing, so assuming he actually did those things, what do you think should have happened to him? What do you think the consequences should have been? If you're like me, I think he should have been severely punished. And the reason we, we think that he should be severely punished is because we have an innate sense of justice within us. That when people do horrible things, they should, be, they should face consequences for it. Now part of the tragedy of this thing is that he died, right? He either killed himself or was murdered. Either, either way, he died. And now other people who were presumably involved in what he did, other people who were abusing and trafficking these girls, maybe won't get their just rewards, right? Their just due. And then that makes us mad because those people should have been punished too, assuming that they might get away. And so we're, we're angry that the guilty weren't properly punished as they should be. And, and the reason we think Epstein deserved punishment, and the reason we're angry that others may avoid punishment, is because we have this innate sense of justice. We believe to the core of our being that evil acts deserve a severe punishment for justice to be served. Okay, now, now consider this. God is holy. God is perfectly holy. And no one has a stronger sense of justice than God does. And because God created us, no one has authority to carry out justice like he does. And so just as God is the epitome of love, so God is also the epitome of justice. He is perfectly holy, and so he demands that all sin be satisfactorily punished. Now, I think most of us can probably agree with that. The, the, I think most of us, the issue we might have with God's wrath is the severity of it. And we think, well, this Epstein character, if he had stayed alive, he would have just gone to jail. He'd just been in prison for a while. You know, it would be bad, but maybe for a long time. That would be a bad punishment. But when we talk about God's justice, we're talking about eternal judgment. We're talking about eternal suffering in hell. And it's like, okay, Hitler maybe deserves that, but... I mean, we don't think most people would deserve that. How could God cause that kind of suffering for people that, that reject him? Well, one of the reasons that God's punishment against sinners is so severe is because God is so great, okay? Now, generally speaking, oftentimes, the greater the person who has been wronged, the more severe is the punishment of the one who's committed that wrongdoing. Just take a hypothetical. So you got Jeffrey Epstein. He did all these horrible things to these girls. And no one did much anything about it, though, right? I mean, he was sentenced to, as I understand it, he was sentenced to prison. And somehow he got, like, out of prison six days a week. He had to go to prison for one day. And even while he's on parole, he continued to take these girls to this island and do all these horrible things to him. And the people at the airport saw this. People were servants saw it. They, re they realized something was going on. They saw this, you know, funny, funny business happening, and they, they didn't even worry about it. Why? Because these girls were of no consequence to them. They were not important people. They weren't people of significance. And so they just let it, let it go. Imagine this. Imagine that Epstein had treated President Obama's daughters when they were teenage girls. Imagine he had treated them the same way as he treated all these other anonymous children. Then what would the punishment have been? He would have been under the jail because President Obama is a great person in our society, right? A person of great authority. You know, if I tell a lie to a friend, a friend might be mad at me, I might lose his friendship. If I lie to the Supreme Court, I can spend years in prison because the Supreme Court is a greater authority than my friend, right? 
And God is of infinite authority, infinite power. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe. And so to defy him, to rebel against him, to commit a crime against him, deserves the greatest punishment. Every time a person tells a lie, he's lying to the creator. Every time a person takes the Lord's name in vain, he's insulting the king of the universe. Every time a person steals, he's stealing from the giver of life. Every time a person commits adultery or lusts after another, he's breaking a covenant that has been made with God. And so there's two ways that God expresses his wrath. The first is as a passive expression of wrath. We, we simply, God is holy and we, we're not in his presence because of our sin. And the inevitable result of that is we're separated from his love and we're separated from his goodness. And that is hell. That is a, a horrible state to be in. But God also actively exercises his wrath by directing his judgment against sinners. And because God is infinitely greater than any other authority in the universe, the punishment he administers against the wrongdoer is infinitely more severe than any other punishment. And if we have any doubt about the severity of God's wrath, all we have to do is look at the cross. And we wear crosses around our neck, we celebrate it because it's a symbol of God's love and grace and mercy, and it is. But we ignore the other side of that. We, t- we tend to ignore that what happened to Jesus is the most graphic depiction we have of what God's wrath looks like. Because when Jesus suffered and died for us, he was enduring the, the, the punishment that we deserve for our sins. Is that not true? And so when Jesus was beaten with rods by these evil soldiers, and when his flesh was torn apart by the, these whips that had chunks of metal on the tassels, and when his head was impaled by this crown of thorns, and when the spikes were driven through his wrists and through his feet, and he hung on the cross to bleed and to slowly suffocate, When he was enduring that pain and that torment, he was enduring the wrath of God poured out upon him that you and I deserve for our sins. And when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For all of eternity, Jesus has had this perfectly harmonious relationship with God the Father until this one moment, because our sins were upon him, he was then separated from God. And he was experiencing what it is to be completely removed from God's love and God's goodness. And so he cries out in agony, why are you forsaking me? And so we look at Jesus on the cross and we see the suffering we deserve for our sins. And we see the wrath that God pours out on sinners and what that wrath looks like. And so here's the good news. You know, you can't have good news without the bad news. We try to do that all the time in Christianity. We try to have the good news without the bad news. The good news doesn't mean anything without the bad news. But here's the good news. The reason that Jesus suffered and died on the cross, and the reason that he literally endured the suffering of hell, is so we don't have to. God chose to rescue us from that pain, that torment. That's why Paul says in verses 4 and 5, But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we are dead through our trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And so God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. He's rescued us from that pain and hardship so that we can be adopted into his family. We can know his love as our father in heaven. And when Jesus rose from the grave and ascended to the right hand of the father, he conquered sin and death for us so we can be heirs of of God's kingdom. We deserve to suffer from God's wrath. But God is so rich in his mercy that he chose to endure the suffering for us by sending his son in our place. And you know, there's nothing we can do to deserve this. There's there's no way we can work hard enough or be holy enough or accomplish anything that will allow us to save ourselves in some way, shape, or form. It's purely by God's grace. It's a gift that God has given us. The, The session decided not long ago that it would be wise for us to have a defibrillator. Okay, so we have a case on the wall over here by the entrance, And one of these days, we're going to get that defibrillator posted in there. We're going to get people trained with CPR training. And so if a tragedy takes place, if someone crumples on the floor and they are under cardiac arrest, their heart stops, their their lungs stop, if they're um, incapacitated, they're unresponsive, we'll have someone that can rush over there and and get the the paddles and and shock them and go through the protocol of CPR. and, and, And Lord willing, that person then would be revived. Well, say that happens. Say, say one of us collapses, heart stops, lungs stop, unresponsive. One of us runs over, performs the works of CPR. 
that person wakes back up. You know, they, they, they're essentially dead, right? Their heart stops, their lungs stop, they're unresponsive. They are essentially dead. And in a few minutes, they will be finally and ultimately dead if nothing, no one intervenes, right? So say someone goes, performs CPR, they're revived. They come to, they come to life, so to speak. Now, what would we do? You can go over the person that, that collapsed on the floor and said, good job, man, way to get back up off the floor. Way to come back to life. Are we, we going to praise that person for what they did? That would be ridiculous, right? We'd be thankful that they're well again. We'd, we'd, we'd thank God with them. We'd celebrate with them that they're okay. But we're not going to praise them for getting up off the floor. The person that we would praise is the one that does the action, the one that, that, that shocks them, that performs CPR. We'd say, way to think on your feet. Good job. You, you saved that person's life. And we'd praise the person that, that did the work. And, and so it is with God. We, we, we can't take credit for our, saving ourselves. We don't praise ourselves for, for saving ourselves. We praise God for the one that, that's brought us out of death and into life. God gets the credit, and God gets the praise. And not only does God make us alive, but there's also a sense that we have in this, in this text that, that God actually kind of raises us up into heaven. It's this, a strange and wonderful thought. But Paul says in verse 6, and he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And I think what's happening here is the reality that one day we're going to go to heaven is so real, so fixed, so, 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 so guaranteed that it's as if we already have a place up there. We're, already, we're getting ready to go up there. And because we have the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, it's like we have communion with God who's in heaven, and we have some sense already of the reality that we're with him uh, up there in, in his kingdom. And so God fills us with his love and his peace and his joy. And the promise is so true that it's as, as if we are already experiencing it on some level. And then finally, Paul says that, God's, in, that as we're in God's presence, we'll receive the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. The immeasurable riches of his grace. An incredible and awesome promise. And so my prayer is that none of us are walking around. <laughs> my prayer is that none of us are walking around, laughing, talking, visiting with each other, in every way, in every sense of the word, um, alive physically and yet dead spiritually. My prayer is that each and every one of us has been made alive by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. My prayer that is each of us will be responsive to the will of God, that we'll swim upstream against our own inclinations and the, 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 the patterns of life and society, the, the forces in, in the world, will swim upstream to do the work of God the Father, to, to pursue his will. It's my prayer that each of us will be sensitive to a relationship of God that will celebrate God's love for us by responding, to, by loving Him in return. And that each of us will be receptive to spending eternity with God that will live each day in the anticipation of being with God forever in the kingdom of heaven. So once we were dead, but now by God's grace we are alive. We are alive in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.